Money. I always found money so fascinating. We use money every single day. We hear conversations about money every single day. But have you ever stopped for a minute and really wondered what it is really? Why we use that? Because at the end of the day, that is just a piece of paper. And we also hear people say that the money that we use today is completely worthless, that we should come back to the gold standard. Other people say that we should go back to bartering. What does that all mean? And how did we arrive here? How did we end up using this a piece of paper as a means of exchange? And why do we even use money in the first place? Those are all the questions we're going to answer in this episode of Money Talk. Let's dive in. Before getting started, please hit the subscribe button down there and activate the notification bell to never miss a new video. So, let us see how we went from using this as a means of exchange to using this, the modern currency. Actually, a very long time ago, people didn't even have money. They used bartering to make exchanges. It means that person A and person B would exchange one object for another. For example, if man cave number one wanted the cow of man cave number two, well, he should propose something to man cave number two in exchange for one cow. Man cave number one could suggest to exchange 10 arrows for one cow. And if both people agreed, well, the exchange took place. And you know, we all did bartering at some point in our life, especially at school. For example, I can trade my football for 10 sweets. Or another example for some people, I will do your homework and you don't beat me up. So you got the idea. Bartering is exchanging one good or service for another good of service directly. And that is how the exchanges were made back in the day, before 3000 BC, when cavemen were riding dinosaurs. What? That's not true? But, as you can imagine, this method had quite a few drawbacks. The main drawback of bartering is the double need of goods. What that means, to take back the example with caveman number one and caveman number two, is that if caveman number two does not want or does not need arrows, well, the exchange cannot take place. Or inversely, if caveman number one does not want a cow, the exchange again cannot take place. And that is why in the Bronze Age, around 3000 or 1200 BC, we're not really sure about that, people started using commodities as a means of exchange. In other words, they use commodities as money. It means that a commodity is used as an intermediary between the two goods that two people want to exchange. Let's take the previous example. In that case, the person one would take the 10 arrows and sell it in a market or wherever for one kilogram of salt. Then he will use that kilogram of salt to buy the cow from person two. As you can see, we don't have this problem of double need of goods like we had before with bartering. And here I used salt as an example, but other commodities were used as a means of exchange. For example, rice, any kind of metals, gold powder, cattle, or even cowrie shells. Yeah, yeah, in some places they used this cowrie shells as a means of exchange. And I find it interesting to know that the word salary might come from the fact that people back then were paid with salt. Salt, salary, and also the fact that capital might be a derivative of the word cattle. But none of that is really verified, so take all that information with a grain of salt. Uh, anyways, back to our program. But using commodities as a means of exchange was also a little bit problematic. First of all, not all commodities were exactly the same. Imagine cattle, for example. Imagine we use cattle as a means of exchange. One cow can be very big, very healthy, and another cow can be very thin and very unhealthy. So they don't really have the same value. And if they don't have exactly the same value, it's difficult to use them as a means of exchange. And another problem when you use commodities as a means of exchange is that some of those commodities, they get bad with time. They spoil or they die, just like cattle, for example. And yet another problem with commodities is that they are sometimes difficult to divide. 
Let's imagine I want to buy two arrows and the seller wants half a cow for those two arrows. How do I do? I cannot cut a cow in half and give him the half cow alive. It's impossible. That is why commodities were dropped soon enough as a means of payment in the most advanced societies back then. And in the Mesopotamian civilization, around 3000 BC, they already used coins. The coins back then were pretty similar to the coins that we have today. They usually had a face and on the back they had a number, 5, 2, 1, whatever that may be. But there was a big difference. Ancient coins were usually made out of gold or silver, whereas coins today are usually made out of nickel. So the coins back then had a real value because the value of the coin was equal to the value of the amount of gold or the amount of silver in the coin. Coins were much better in every aspect than commodities as a means of exchange because coins, well, they didn't turn bad, they didn't spoil, and it was very easy to divide. You have a coin of a value of 5, a coin of a value of 2, a coin of a value of 1, etc. Coins made exchanges even easier. If we take back our example of our two friends previously, well, the arrow guy simply sells the arrows for a certain amount of coins and he uses those coins to buy the cow. No spoilage, easy to divide, it's much better, isn't it? But that system was not perfect either because scammers could put other metals in the coin and then pretend it was gold. Or even sometimes the kings made that. They put other metal in their coins to pretend then that it was 100% gold when their kingdom was in financial pressure. But even though it was not perfect, this payment method was used for centuries and centuries because we had to wait up until the 16th century up until the new type of money appeared, the paper money. Paper money first appeared in Asia, but it was the Europeans that made paper money mainstream. It was more precisely the English who were the first to introduce paper money as a payment method. Paper money was also called reserve money. And you're going to understand right now why they called it reserve money. In England, in the 16th century, most people stored their wealth in gold, whether that was gold coins, gold ingots, or gold jewelry. And as you can imagine, carrying around all that gold with you or storing all that gold in your house was extremely dangerous. Why would you want to store a lot of gold in your house to have it robbed anyways? That is why people usually handed almost all their gold to a goldsmith who would keep it safely with them. And in exchange, the people who deposited the gold by the goldsmith would receive a note from the goldsmith stating that they had deposited X amount of gold in a given goldsmith. So that later, when you needed the gold for whatever reason, you could go to the goldsmith to claim back your gold. So far so good, people used gold as a means of exchange and whenever they had an extra amount of gold, they would deposit that gold by the goldsmith and they would receive in exchange a note. But something very interesting happened. Progressively, people had the very good idea to use the notes they had received from the goldsmith as a means of exchange. Because think about it, normally when I want to pay somebody, I would need to take the note from the goldsmith, go to my goldsmith, retrieve the gold, give the gold to that person I want to buy something from, then this person would go to his goldsmith, deposit the gold at his goldsmith and receive himself a note. That is a long and hard process. So we just exchange the notes of the goldsmith and that's it. We made the transaction without going through all this lengthy process. As you can see, using the notes of the goldsmiths was much more convenient and much more comfy than using gold itself. Think about it. A note, it's foldable. You can put it in your wallet. You can put many, many, many notes in a wallet. Gold, it's heavy, it takes a lot of place, and it's also very dangerous because when you walk around with gold, you run the risk of getting robbed. So there you see, that is how and why the notes progressively replaced the gold coins as a means of exchange. The notes, were called paper money and it became mainstream. The goldsmiths made a few interesting observations. Of course, they saw that people were using the notes as money, but they observed something else. The goldsmiths observed that very few people were coming to them with the notes to claim back the gold that was in the reserve. 
So the goldsmiths had a huge amount of gold reserves. People were using their notes as money. And it is exactly at that moment that the goldsmiths had a very good idea. No, it was not a very good idea. It was a genius idea. They had the following idea. Hey, you know what? I've got an idea. Since most people, they never use the notes to withdraw the gold that we have in our reserve. And since people use the notes as money, what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue new notes. I'm going to lend those notes to people who want to borrow money for an interest. I'm going to get a lot of interest without getting more gold in our reserves. So the goldsmiths had the idea to issue more notes, to lend it to people for an interest, which means that there were more notes at some point than there were gold reserves. The goldsmiths had what is called a fractional reserve. This idea that seems very simple completely revolutionized our society. And it is exactly at that moment that the fractional reserve money is born. That is the money that we still use today. And that is how also the goldsmiths became bankers. And we can also say that the modern banking system was born at that moment. This fractional reserve system opened a lot and a lot of possibilities. Imagine an entrepreneur. Normally an entrepreneur has a very hard time to get funding. With the fractional reserve system, it was much, much easier for them to get access to funding. The entrepreneur was super happy because he was able to get funding for his business. And at the same time, the goldsmith, who had become a banker, made a lot of money thanks to the interest. In short, the fractional reserve system made the life better for everybody. It was an absolute money machine. Bankers were making fortunes out of thin air. But I know what some of you are wondering right now. What could go wrong? Well, the weakness of that money can be found in its name, the fractional reserve system. Because here's the thing, the notes outstanding could claim an amount of gold that was much, much higher than the gold that was in the reserves of the bank. Let's take an example. Let's imagine a bank that has 10 tons of gold in the reserves. And the bank issued so many notes that all those notes combined can claim a total amount of 100 tons of gold. The reserves of the bank are only a fraction of the total amounts of notes outstanding. In that case, it represents one-tenth. And the danger in that specific case is that all those people who have all those notes, they suddenly go all together to the bank to claim the gold. That is called a run on the bank. And of course, if there was such a run on the bank, the bank would not be able to give back all that amount of gold. The bank would be completely bankrupt. And the people who deposited the gold at that specific bank would lose everything. As a consequence, the bankers had to be very careful, very conservative. Number one, they had to be careful not to issue too many notes. And they had to be also very careful who they would lend those notes to. Because if people know that this bank is issuing too many notes or lending money to dubious people who do not pay back, those people could lose trust and they could take all their notes to claim back the gold. And if too many people do that at the same time, it is a run on the bank. Bankers really had to manage a very fragile and delicate balance. They had to issue enough notes to maximize their profits, but at the same time, they had to issue not too many notes to keep the trust. And trust plays a crucial role in the fractional reserve system. If trust goes away, for one reason or another, the whole system collapses. And back in the day, when banks were still issuing their own notes, well, bankruptcies and run of the banks were very frequent. And very often, people lost all of their savings. It was a real issue, and being a banker was a pretty dangerous job. And those run of the banks and bankruptcies could really foster political instability. For those reasons, the governments all around the world decided to step in, to put some order in that mess, to centralize everything. At that moment, the party was over for bankers, because from that moment onward, only the government had the power to issue money. The era of paper money was born to leave the place to the centralized fractional reserve system, where only one bank, one central bank, would store all the gold, I would have the authority and the power to issue money. And the first central bank to be ever created was the Zveriges Riksbank. Yes, yes, I know my Swedish pronunciation is not very good because I live in Switzerland. 
not in Sweden. And let me explain that a little bit better, because the money in itself was still the same. It was a fractional reserve system, but in that case, it was centralized to one single bank, the central bank. In that case, the central bank decides what will be the amount of money into the economy. If they want to increase the amount of money into the economy, very simply, they print more notes, and then with those notes, they purchase gold. If you want to know more about why a central bank would want to have more or less money into the economy, check out that video. I talk about it in great detail. And that's it. That's the role of a central bank, to control the amount of money into the economy. And the commercial banks, in the meantime, the banks that previously issued the notes, well, obviously, they cannot issue the notes anymore. Only the central bank can do that. They decided to do things differently. They decided to take the money of the people as deposits and put it in their reserve. And then, when somebody wanted to borrow money from the bank, the bank would not lend the money. They would not lend the physical money. They would simply credit the account of the borrower with intangible money. Yes, I know it might be difficult to believe or even to understand, but banks at that moment, and that's what they still do today, they create money out of thin air, intangible money. I think you will understand a bit better if I do a comparison with an old bank that had gold and notes with a modern bank that has notes as deposit and intangible money. As you remember, the old banks would have gold in their reserves and when they wanted to lend money to somebody, they would create money out of thin air by creating more notes. For modern banks, it is exactly the same, but instead of having gold in their reserves, they have physical money, banknotes. And when they want to lend money, they issue intangible money. They just credit the account of the borrower. This intangible money is called scriptural money. Think about it. You use scriptural money every time you use a credit card or a debit card or whenever you do a transaction via PayPal or Stripe or when you use checks for people who are a bit older or people who live in the US. Whenever you do such a transaction, you are using scriptural money, money that is intangible. Think about it. You never or very rarely use the physical money. And that is how centralized paper money works. But, as some of you may have already noticed, the dangers of the centralized paper money are still the same because we're still using the fractional reserve system. If you suddenly go to the bank to claim all your savings in cash, there would be still a bankruptcy because we're still using a fractional reserve system. The amount of scriptural money issued by commercial banks is much, much bigger than the amount of physical money that they have in their reserves. So we still have the danger of run on the banks and bankruptcies. And that is exactly what happened in 2008 and 2009 during the great financial crisis. We saw spectacular and huge runs on the bank. Because again, people had lost faith in the banking system and they wanted to withdraw all of their savings. So now you know everything about fractional reserve money. But I have bad news for you because today, the money that you have in your pocket, well, that's not fractional reserve money. That's fiat money. Yes, fiat money is the money that we use today and it is our last step in this journey of the history of money. And uh, no, fiat money has nothing to do with the Italian car. Nothing. Because yes, the fractional reserve money that we talked about previously and the fiat money, the money that we use today, are very, very different. In the case of the fractional reserve money, whenever the central bank wanted to issue more money, they simply bought more gold. There was what we called a gold standard. Every banknote had a gold equivalent. You could go to the central bank and exchange a banknote for a predetermined amount of gold. I know it sounds weird for people today, but back in the day, you could go to the central bank with this bank note and exchange it for a predetermined amount of gold. The gold standard was used to give some kind of intrinsic value to the money, to somehow safeguard its purchasing power, to give it a stable value over time. And that was the case for almost all the countries in the world. You could go with your money to the central bank and exchange it for a fixed amount of gold. But those days are long gone. In 1971, the then President of the United States, Richard Nixon, decided to withdraw the gold standard. 
From that moment onward, it was not possible anymore to exchange your dollars for gold. It's not very clear why the president decided to do such a thing. But apparently, the country at that moment was facing a lot of financial pressure to pay its debts. And Nixon wanted an easy way to pay that debt, and that would be printing money. But the gold standards was getting in the way to print money to pay off the debt. So, to get that obstacle out of the way, he removed the gold standard. From 1971 onwards, the money became fiat money, which is basically a piece of paper because it has no intrinsic value. We cannot exchange it for any fixed amount of gold. So, yeah, we can say that today, fiat money is only a piece of paper. Shortly after the adoption of the fiat money, huge inflation rates appeared in all the countries that had adopted the fiat money. Was that because of the fiat money? We're not really sure, but probably. So in this video, we covered the history of money. We saw how people went from using this as a means of exchange, carry shells, to use this, the modern fiat money. But some of you may be wondering, what is the future of money? As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If that is the case, a little thumbs up is always appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe and if there is a topic you want me to cover in a future video, feel free to put it in the comment section below or shoot me an email to the address that is in the description below. I will see you very soon for the next episode. In the meantime, take care.